Hello everyone, welcome to the GOE Ecologist. I'm Dr. Krishnanand and you have been watching my videos on my channel The GOE Ecologist on various topics of geography. So if you're new to this channel, please go to the playlist section to check for the earlier videos. And if you want to have a course on geography optional, which is a paid online course, you can visit our website thegeoecologist.com or also you can download our app The GOE Ecologist from the Play Store and check the details there. So now in this session on political geography we are going to learn about the various geographical characteristics of a state for example size of a state shape territoriality then we are going to look into the boundaries and frontiers and the differences between them and also at the end we'll be looking into the sovereignty factor so before we go ahead don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also do share the videos with others as well So now let's understand about the geographical characteristics of a state. So what are the characteristics? First of all, let's look at the list. So the list is we need to look into the size, shape, territory, frontiers, boundaries and then sovereignty. So all these attributes we are going to discuss one by one. So watch the video till the end. So now let's start with the size of a state. So whenever we talk about size of a state, it also talks about something which is a scale factor in geography. That at what level are we looking into? So is it at a macro level, at world level or at a country level or at a state level? So what is the jurisdiction that we are looking into? So when we say size of a state, we also look into how large it is or how small it is in terms of area or its territory. So for example, you'll see here Canada, Russia, Australia. These are very large states. If you can check out on this particular map, you observe carefully that which states are the largest states in the world. So you have Canada, USA, Russia, then you have China, India, Australia, Algeria, Brazil, Argentina, and then you have the Kazakhstan. These are the biggest states in the world in terms of area, in terms of size. So let's look into some more data. So for example, the Vatican City is just having 44 hectares of area, while Russia is 16889390 square kilometers. So if you observe, there is a drastic range between these smallest nations in the world and the largest nations in the world. And then we have a data for it. So if you observe this particular Canada, China, USA, Brazil, Australia, these are the largest countries of the world in terms of area. Where well, there are some other small countries if you see African countries like Burundi then you see Lebanon then you see Vatican City these countries of Asia Minor and then you have Vatican City as the smallest as we know then Netherlands and Liberia as well UK Poland in medium large is France and Ethiopia very large is Russia and Canada so this can be another classification from very small to very large but why are we talking about in terms of the geographical characteristics of the space because these represent this particular map that is the world map that you observe through the sizes of the state and that is where we see also sometimes the dominating states or dominated states but let's look into it the advantages of the size so basic generalization gives us that a big size states will obviously have its advantage in terms of location and also in terms of environmental regions mineral belts trade routes for instance, if you want to check into USA, it's lying in the middle latitudes and it has world's many transition zones in terms of climate, in terms of soil and also it is fronting two oceans, Atlantic and Pacific. So it has a wider outreach and if also you remember the earlier theories of Rimland theory or say Heartland theory, this land was obviously away from the Heartland and from the Rimland and so it was also protected for certain reasons because it is covered by oceans from all sides. So various kinds of advantages geostrategic positions and locational advantages you find in these countries but at the same time we also have the disadvantages so what are the disadvantages first is that defense becomes a burden in these states where you have a huge area to cover then fields are inadequately farmed so agriculture may be an issue then too large margin for natural products and also administrative issues generally keep cropping up so that's one problem for instance, if you check Australia's central desert, 
then you have Siberia and Canadian Shield. All of them exemplify the barrier effect of these vastness of these territories. So these are certain aspects geographically if you look into the size of these states. Then further, let's look into the shapes of these particular states. So countries shape also reflect a lot of things about its development and control and how it is attached to the nearby countries and what, what is its geographical influence in the world. So if you observe these maps, look at Chile. It's elongated state here, this one, right? And then there is Pacific Ocean here. And also if you observe here, Norway is another elongated state. Then you have compact state like here. If you observe these countries in Africa, then you have the prorupt states like this. So it's like one end is elongated. So Thailand, if you observe here, then Philippines is fragmented, several islands out here. Then perforated state where you have one enclave between one country. So Lesotho and South Africa. So what are these? These are different kinds of shapes of a state. So if you look at it geographically, Compact states are relatively having equal distances from their center to their boundary. So mostly Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, all these African states you will see as an example. Further, if you see elongated states as we see here, Vietnam, Norway, Chile, all of them are a good example. They are elongated, narrow in shape. Then further, if you observe the prorupted states. Now it is very important to understand that they are nearly compact but they possess an extension in territory from a particular area that is maybe a peninsula. So this kind of example is that one end is basically prorupted. It's like a corridor that is built. So prorruption may simply reflect peninsular elongations of land and in case of Myanmar and Thailand we clearly observe this and also prorruptions of Afghanistan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Namibia, all of them fall in the same category. Then if you observe further perforation perforated state. It means a state within a state, some kind of enclave. So Lesotho is a good example here if you observe in South Africa, which is a sovereign state of its own within the territories of South Africa. So this is something as a perforated state. And then we have the fragmented state as you see the Philippines example, Indonesia example, Italy as well and Malaysia as well. So a lot of islands are there and inclusive of this, it becomes a entirely fragmented state. Then further if you observe, fragmentation also helped lead into the dis integration of Pakistan. So if you observe East and West Pakistan, which was further now declared as Bangladesh in 1971. So it was kind of a fragmented state until 1971 as well. So if you observe these kinds of shapes of a state and also there are some landlocked states. Most of them you'll find in Africa or also in the Middle Eastern areas of the Asia Minor. So you have landlocked states in Central Asia as well as one of the example if you remember is Mongolia. So Mongolia is sandwiched between Russia and also China. So this is one example. Now let's look into the concept of enclave and also exclave. So what is enclave and what is exclave? So here is the example. An enclave is a territory which geographical boundaries lie entirely within another territory. So Lesotho is given as general common example, but it's not the only one. If you observe within Italy's territory, we have San Marino as well and Vatican as well. So these are another two examples apart from Lesotho as you see. And what is an exclave then? An exclave is on the other hand, it's a territory legally or politically attached to another territory which is not physically in contact. So in case of Alaska, if you observe, it is part of United States. It's the 49th state of US, right? But it's not directly in contact with US because it's bounded by Canada here. So this is called exclave. So these are certain examples of the territories that we mark here. So what is a territory in that way? It's basically the aerial coverage, the area of a land or sea or space that belongs to a particular country or in terms of ecology, if you go, it can belong to an animal as well, to a person as well. So you can mark your territory, you know, the tiger marks its territory, right? So in international politics, in political geography, in geopolitics, a territory is either the total area from which a state may extract power or resources and also have an administrative control, the jurisdiction, the sovereignty over that. That's your territory. So if you observe here, some examples of the territory include the various types. For example, one is called capital territory. Now we have NCT, National Capital Territory. It's basically what? It is designated area where country's government's major seat is located. Then, for example, you have the second one called dependent territory. What is dependent? The word itself tells you its dependency is there. So a territory that is not an independent sovereign state yet remains politically outside
inside the governing integral area. So you'll have several of them in New Zealand, Norway, United Kingdom and United States which have these kind of dependent territories of their own. Then further if you observe is disputed territory and I'm sure you know about so many disputes across the world. So for example disputes of POK that we see here between India and Pakistan. So Pakistan occupied Kashmir one of the disputed territory. Then if you have the Taiwan with China there is a conflict and also you have the Crimea and the Russia and already Ukraine and Russia issues are going on with Donbass region. So disputed territories are common in many parts of the world and many wars are going on and many have already been there. Then if you observe federal territory. So federal territory the word is something which is shared between center and state. So within the direct and usually exclusive jurisdiction of central or national government within a federation. So there is a sharing but control is of the central government. That's a federal territory within a state. So that's important. And then you have maritime territory. And if you remember in oceanography lectures, we talked about UN clause. So we have international law of the sea, which talks about the maritime boundaries. And you see the various kinds of zonations there. So you have exclusive economic zone, you have the territorial sea and others so those are the examples if you see maritime territory then further if you observe occupied territory so which of these territories is occupied now this is by force an outside power occupies it so if you observe Crimea has been occupied by Russian Federation then you see East Jerusalem Gaza Strip and Golan Heights are example and West Bank occupied by the state of Israel then you have Western Sahara partially occupied the kingdom of Morocco and several others are example then further you observe overseas territory as the word itself tells you it's a broad designation for a territorial entity which is separated from the country and governs it through the ocean so if you observe certain example the Faroe Islands the Greenland are basically taken over by kingdoms of Denmark. Then further if you observe is the unorganized territory. As the word tells you there is no clear jurisdiction because of remoteness, outlying sparse population, uninhabited areas. These kind of territories are often seen in the areas where you have wilderness. So in Australia, in New Zealand and some other parts and in Antarctica and near the poles you will find this unorganized territories as well. And now let's go further and understand the concepts of boundaries and frontiers. So boundary is basically a physical limit of sovereignty where state's jurisdiction is practiced or manifested. It means if I draw a boundary, what does it signify? That if this is my center, this is my boundary and this is my jurisdiction. I am sovereign within it. So it's basically inward looking concept. Then further if you observe its characteristics here, so it is possible to recognize frontier characteristics in boundary as well, especially where you have sparsely populated areas such as deserts. So what is basically an example of boundary between Spain and Portugal? So there is a boundary but they are not stringent ones. Then you have an appropriate concept of the modern state where the boundaries is basically under the control of the state. So what you observe, it's an outer line of effective control of the central government in one line if you want to look into it. So a legal political phenomena is what a boundary represents. So basically if I tell you what it signifies in simple ways, so it signifies the goals, ideology, structure, interests of the government that rules that territory which gives you the firm affirmation that this area is under our jurisdiction. So boundary is basically a legal political unit. Then further if you observe what is frontier then. So the word itself comes from front. I'm sure you have read the concepts of air front in climatology. So where you have the end portion which is interacting with the outside. So this is a zone where you interact with the other. So it's outward looking idea of the territoriality of a state. So in past political evolutions of a state were based on frontiers. People used to expand and they used to expand the territory through expansion on the frontiers. So there was no clear cut jurisdiction in terms of boundary during the age of empires. Right? But later on what you observe is the borderland and boundaries started to create. So in French in 15th century, the borderland was created as a meaning where you observe that there is an interaction zone between two states. So politico-geographical area is basically a frontier and it may not be just single position. It may be a group of villages or a particular area or an extension of area which could be talked as a frontier. So basically it's a physical as well as a moral concept. 
and also it is outward looking concept it's not inward looking concept like a boundary that's important to understand and then what is the difference between the two so you can read out the points out here boundary is basically oriented inwards right and it's basically very important for our definition of eukmean and the concept of aristotle's zones of habitability eratosthenes in geographical thought if you have checked it so you'll observe that this is majorly talking about the manifestation of power to a particular limit boundary is also created and maintained by the will of the government so it's a political legal entity and then boundary is well defined and regulated by law while if you observe the frontiers are transition zones between two geographical regions right so this is the difference here frontiers phenomena of past while boundaries are of the present so earlier empires used to have frontiers they did not have a fixed boundary expansionist approach was there but then later on when the proper establishment of governments happened federation happened democratic government setup happened so then boundaries were affirmed on the spaces so what you observe is frontier whether physical linguistic religious or ethnic cannot be moved but you can fix your boundaries and move it as per the treaties across the world bilateral treaty and then you have a lot of treaties in during the colonial age where colonists left and then they created different kinds of boundaries so that will separately study in the classification of boundaries in different lecture so what you observe the last important attribute of a state that we have already talked in previous lectures also is sovereignty the traditional definition of sovereignty is highest power or final power of the authority in a given territory right so state is an area that has a sovereign government but for official definition you must look into this independent international commission on intervention and state sovereignty which was established in the year 2000 by canada so what is the definition according to this commission the state authorities are responsible for functions of protecting the safety and lives of citizen and also promotion of their welfare within that given area so it does not mean only exercising power or authority it means taking care of the people within that sovereign unit as well so that's more of a socialist definition or social welfare definition that you see of sovereignty otherwise general definitions of sovereignty or the past definitions of sovereignty were all built on the concept of power of the state then to understand the various types you have titular sovereignty in the name of the king or the queen or the title or the landlord then you have internal and external sovereignty between two states and then you have legal and political sovereignty where your legal jurisdiction is defined then you have de facto and de jure sovereignty so de jure sovereignty refers to legal right to have that particular land under your control but de facto sovereignty is basically factual ability to have that power so i may have a right by birth but if i'm a weak administrator do i have the actual control on that area so that is where de facto and de jure sovereignty is there and then you have the popular sovereignty so because of some popular movement or because of some popular uprising you declare yourself as an independent state that's where your popular sovereignty comes into the picture so these are the basic ideas of the geographical characteristics of a state so now when we have discussed the various aspects of the geographical characteristics of a state in this session in the next session we'll be looking into different other aspects of political geography so stay tuned stay safe keep watching and learning and don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also please share the videos with others as well